Um, hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Oliver, and I'm the head of Archives and Special Collections at Wolverd Laurier University. The Laurier Archives and Special Collections holds a vast collection of university records, archival material, and rare books, with a collecting emphasis on the history of Wilfrid Laurier University, the environmental conservation movement in Canada, the Lutheran Church in Canada, and Canadian music. We are located on the first floor of the Laurier Library, and we are open to the public. The Lori Archives and Special Collections annually hosts a spring lecture on a topic connected to our collections. And thank you so much for joining us today for our 2023 spring lecture. I'd like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the shared traditional territory of the Neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Acknowledging them reminds us of the important connection to the land where we live, learn, and work. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which Laurier is now present. I encourage you to consider the traditional lands you are joining us from today. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to go over a few Zoom housekeeping items. So you are muted and your video is turned off. I invite you to sit back and enjoy the lecture. Captions are enabled for this webinar. If you would benefit from captions, please click on the button with the CC icon along the bottom of your screen to enable this feature. We will be utilizing the Q&A function today. So to ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And we'll be taking questions throughout the lecture today. So please feel free to add questions as you think of them or as they come to you. I would now like to introduce our speakers. Pat and Rosemary Keough are internationally acclaimed photographers, authors, and private press publishers. The Keoghs have received many prestigious honors, including World's Best Nature Photographers, World's Best Photography, uh, photo, Photography Book, and World's Best Printing and Outstanding Book Arts. Institutions around the world have acquired their work. The Lori Archives and Special Collections have both Antarctica and Labyrinth Sublime in our collection, so please reach out to us if you are interested in viewing these volumes in our reading room. A complete archive of the Keogh's career in the book arts is maintained by Yale University Arts Library with materials dating to a booklet made by Rosemary when she was in kindergarten. Pat and Rosemary have created eight art books exclusively portraying their imagery and mounted numerous exhibitions of their photos in Europe and North America. They often present lectures around the world most recently in Lisbon for Earth Day celebrations at the Portuguese National Natural History and Sciences Museum. The Keos are fellows and medalists of the Explorers Club, medalists of Britain's Royal Geographical Society, and fellows of the Canadian Geographical Society. Their lecture today is titled Antarctica, Passion and Obsession. They will share insights into their celebrated fine arts, uh, fine press artist book, Antarctica, including Antarctic exploration, imagery, design, considerations, state-of-the-art lithography technology, centuries-old hand-binding skills, and archival vegetable leather tannage. So please join me in welcoming Pat and Rosemary. Oh. Thank you, Amanda. That was great. Yeah, thank you very much, Amanda. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special presentation. We're going to take you on a journey through passion of obsession. We we're very passionate about our photography and we've been doing this almost 40 years together. And Antarctica was the culmination of many years of photography for us. And a lot of research and investigation into the book arts, which was a progression for us. We have quite an extensive program to share and we thought we'd just give you a little structure because as Amanda said, after each section, there's a chance for some Q&A rather than holding all questions to the very end. So we have our structure with, oops, oh, hang on. It's not, my images are not going forwards. Ah, oh, there, 
we just had to delay, excuse us. <laughs> Section one will be an overview of our careers in the book arts and photography and an overview of Antarctica, this beautiful tome, and a little bit about the material specification and design considerations for such a, a volume. Then we'll take some questions. Following is our multi-year experiences in the Antarctic. Just to give you an idea of what it's like to be there to work as photographers while bringing a child with you. So we were, we were parents in Antarctica with a seven-year-old child yeah. at the time, and it was quite the experience for him and for us. And section three will be now about the physical book, why we chose the different binding methods, why and how did we find the lithographers that we chose, what was the technology, and what's this about leather that's so special for this book? So that's a large topic. Following that is how, how has this been received by the critics, by the academics, by the public? And then we'll see what time we have because there's other subjects as well that we have prepared. We'll just see, we'll be flexible depending on what, how many questions you have. You don't want to get us talking too much because it could go on for many, many hours. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so many aspects, but we first start in 1984, which is when we met. We didn't know each other at all. And uh, we just inadvertently ended up on the South Nahani River on the headwaters, right where this picture was taken, in a canoe together on our first date. Our first date was a month together, <laughs> canoeing down this class four and five water river. And we figured after doing that, we may as well stay together. And we ended up going to our honeymoon in India and eventually into the book ours. Yeah, we, um, our first day, as Pat said, was a month of canoe together with 10 other people. And uh, we were engaged six weeks later and married within four months, believe it or not. And it was on our honeymoon that we thought, we really like this world of adventure. Mm -hmm. What skills do we have? Because I was in finance and Pat was in management of, in the oil and gas industry. And so we were both part of the corporate world and we enjoyed the way we had met each other and the way we had our honeymoon in India. And we thought, how can we do this? Yeah, so we both were bibliophiles. We love books. We had quite an extensive library. We still do. And we thought, well, we're great amateur photographers. We've never written anything, but why don't we do books? And we didn't know anything about books. We produced these six books that you see here, starting with the Ottawa Valley Portfolio, which was our home that was released in 1986, about one month after the birth of our daughter, Rebecca. The Recognize the Mountain in the middle book there in the Nahani Portfolio. Interestingly, the topics that we chose, Niagara Scarpment, Nahani, Sable Island, each of those places after we had done our work, there is an expansion or a creation of a park. It's just kind of neat. We were there yeah. early in the way. We had something to do with raising public awareness of the uniqueness of many of these areas. But then commercial books have budget restraints and budget restraints means you have to accept things like pleasing color rather than accurate color. There's a lot about the commercial world that didn't appeal to us because we're perfectionists. And every time we would look at one of our newly printed books, although they won lots of accolades in that, there was still something in a picture or two here and there that we say, oh boy, we missed it on this one. It didn't quite get it. And we started dreaming about doing the books best, of perfection. Perfect, best book you could possibly right. do. Like, forget budget. Let's just look at how we can get excellence and then price accordingly. And that led to a multi-year search in publishing in for Antarctica and following Labyrinth Sublime, both of which the university has here. But what is Antarctica? Because many of you have not actually physically held this or seen it, and we encourage you to do so. It is an artist book, it's fine press, it's fine binding, it's private press, our company Nahani Productions, named after the river we met, yeah. has only two employees, and that's us, you're looking at us. It, per <laughs> it pertains equally to the humanities, the science, to polar and environmental collections. Mm -hmm. It appeals to many people for many various reasons. It's a big book, 336 pages, including 345 of our photographs. 
And uh, yeah, and also has this accompanying linen presentation box. So all told, it's a weighty item. In How fact, much does it weigh? <laughs> huh. As much as a as weight two. of two Gentoo penguins. Now, how much does a Gentoo penguin weigh? Well, a two-year-old child. Yeah, our book is the weight of a two-year-old child at almost 28 pounds in its presentation box. And how big is that size-wise? Well, it's, it's a handful. It's a handful. Prince Charles, who's now King Charles, hosted the book launch for us at his home, St. James's Palace in London, England. We had a lovely time of it there. But you can see just the size of the book in Charles's hand. And Pat has a presentation box. So, you know, books aren't measured by their size, but the size and weight we had in mind, this monumental skill, brought to light a lot of design considerations for the structure. How do you support such a book? And then even beyond, once a book was created, our collectors said to us, how do we support such a book? How do we display it in our homes? And that led... <laughs> how do we show it? So unbeknownst to us when we went on a search for perfection in the book arts it led us on a whole other journey into how were books constructed from years and years ago to how do you display them and if each time we went on one of these tangents it involved years of research and looking into how to do it right yeah so the book opens to just under a meter or just about a yard and uh, we had this wonderful book stand which is now all sold out we had just over 100 made and that's it uh, but here's our book antarctica it's got a beautiful morocco gray leather why gray here's a question why gray why is there no color why is there no special standout design like a poster saying look at me look at me think of the polar regions so for half the year roughly a little less than half a year they're shrouded in darkness. They're very dark. And the opening of the book, the beginning of the book, shows you a dark cover. And then as the sun comes up, you open the cover and you're you move met into the with light. beautiful color and light. And much of the Antarctic, like the Arctic, has only uh, one night and one day over the course of the whole year, and each lasts six months. So you have darkness. There's also something about understated elegance and that's how we feel about this understated elegance you turn the page and now we have our end leaf and the fly leaf and this is actually really a tactile experience we have french flocked velvet and feeling the velvet after that beautiful leather of the cover is a nice sensation and quite different from other books but look at the model pattern of our of the choice of our french velvet and this, why we chose this, is it reminds us of two things to do with the Antarctic. The Weddell seal, look, look at the pelt on this seal. It's almost, it's a dark pelt with lights, lighter areas on it. And it reminded us very much of the The velvet, velvet. we went to this. And the Weddell seal is important because it's the only mammal that spends its entire life in the Antarctic. It doesn't move north to escape the onset of winter and the spread of ice other than humans who have a huge support system to be in the Antarctic. Another creature that stays in the Antarctic year round is the emperor penguin. And these are emperor penguin. You can see the adults in the background. Uh, there's a well-fed <laughs> youngster in the foreground here and they too spend the, the whole year down there. And mm -hmm. look at the softness of the down. That to us is reminiscent of the velvet. So the velvet was chose because it was res reminiscent of the soft down of the penguins, chicks, and of the pelage of the seals. Now, these guys are on sea ice. It's not land. They breed on the ice. And the ice has to, is fast, meaning it's not moving fast. Is that it's fastened to the shore in the areas where it's the ice is there long enough that uh, the chicks have a chance to grow and molt to waterproof adult palo plumage before the ice breaks up. And that's the clue. They have to be able to get their waterproof plumage in place before the breakup. Otherwise, they're dead. Yeah, they drown. And the 
Icy ice is incredibly important, as is glacier ice. This is an Adeli on glacier ice. Here's Adelis that are on the uh, sea ice. And the sea ice is integral to the entire food chain. On the underside is our diatoms, and they use the ice as a substrate to grow. And the diatoms are then eaten by krill, and everything in the Antarctic eats krill, from the penguins to the fish to blue whale. If you flip a block of that ice over, you'll see it's got a slightly brownish color to it. And that's where the diatoms yeah. are. And on this map of the Antarctic, we're showing you here, the ice is like a heartbeat. It grows in winter and then it goes away Oops. in summer. It grows back and forth. It, this heartbeat influences the circulation of the world's oceans. And how much ice is that? Well, look at the quantity of ice compared to this overlay of Europe. So Antarctica encompasses the whole of the European continent. And the ice is that huge and that has a major influence. Now, just of interest, the sea ice this past February was the lowest ever recorded. And in the many years, 2017 to, to current each year, there was a below average summer ice extent. Things and on are the changing. peninsula, that part of Antarctica that's sticking up so, sort of towards Cape Horn and South America, the temperatures have been rising dramatically over the last yeah. few decades. Anomaly or trend? Probably a trend. Now we've been in the Antarctic since 1999. Our last trip there was 2017. At the early years to enter the Antarctic, you had to go through sea ice. And these are this is called pancake ice. It's pan ice that is reforming. And we thought when we were down there working on this book, doesn't this look a lot like marble paper? So we're thinking of end leaf paper on a book. And we got thinking about what could we put in our book to represent Antarctica, but add a hint of the traditional yeah. way of looking at it. As we started our search about books, at uh, looking at special collections and seeing beautiful hand-bound books, and many of them had marble and leaves and fly leaves. And we thought, yes, but we're photographers, so how can we emulate this? Well, take a look at these marble papers that are from the 17 and 1800s. And now here's one of our photos. So what we did is we photographed the sea ice in an abstract way in order to use it in the book. And there, so you enter the Antarctic through the sea ice, you enter our book, Antarctica through the sea ice. You turn the page, the sea ice uh, has a transition, and now we have our, our certificate of limitation. This is a limited edition of 950 books plus copies of proofs. And there's another signature in addition to Pat and mine. Queen, Queen Noor at the time uh, signed each of the books and we were involved with them uh, in an effort to save the wandering albatross. To the bring some attention beautiful seabirds. to these seabirds of that live right around the Antarctic in the big winds. And that's another whole story. So we'll move <laughs> on to the title page. <laughs> yeah. The title page, it's a page that uh, has the iconic emperor penguin. Uh, and it's in whiteout conditions. You can see in that picture, there's sort of a wedge shape to the, the uh, penguins. It's one of my favorite pictures. Rosemary shot this picture in the middle of a screaming blizzard, whiteout. And the penguins at the back, that broad line, are acting as a windshield. And as they get colder, they peel off and they come down around the front and stand up where those penguins are in the foreground and they're sort of protected from the wind by the penguins in the yeah. back. Now like a human, these penguins put their back to the wind. If you think of any birds in our, in where we live here in Canada, the birds put their faces to the wind so that their feathers don't ruffle. These guys put their backs to the wind. So we have a picture that's got geometry to it. It's, it's minimalistic, so it has an art element, but it also has a biology element. And that's what we liked with our book, that our imagery and our presentation, that it bridges the sciences and the humanities. We have quite an extensive
that's of text in this book as well. They're written for the layperson, but with the accuracy checked by experts in every field. And usually we had two experts from different hemispheres in case there was controversy over details, which there were. We ended up with uh, anywhere up to four or five scientists and experts on Antarctica checking every single thing we wrote about. In each discipline, yeah. in each discipline. And uh, just a little bit about pairing images. Here we've got monochromatic to color. You could say that there's fingers of, of, of white on one page and the other is red going out. You've got a triangular shape, a beak island in the monochromatic image. And then you've got a tiny little island, Smith Island to the right. Other times we have a detail. We've got the broad picture of the colony of these penguins and then a close up. So this picture again was a picture that Rosemary shot and they're two of my favorites. <laughs> the, the picture beside it as uh, of the breast feathers. Oh, do you want me to move to that one? Yeah. Okay. So this is a detail of the breast feathers of the emperor penguin. And it was rather humorous. We were giving a talk in the Middle East at one point and some people in the audience said, oh, sand dunes. Well, they're not sand dunes, they're actually feathers. Yes, and to take this picture in the days of film, I had to actually dig a little hole in the ice and go down low so my head uh, could look through the viewfinder. There were no, none of these adjustable viewfinders. So she put her chin days. in a hole in the snow <laughs> in order to shoot up. And of course, in those days, the cameras would sometimes freeze up. We always had numerous cameras with us. Uh, again, a detail, blue ice. We'll talk more about blue ice later, very ancient ice. We have the iceberg and then up close, and we've got this lovely serpentine line, very feminine, even though it's hard ice. It's got very a feminine old, very feel hard to it. Ice. And these two pictures were taken year years apart, apart yeah. two years apart. And yet the way we've decided in the design, because we are the designers of our work, is that the horizon line flows from the picture on the left across to the right. These were taken on a place called Deception Island and they harken back to the days of the whalers. This was a big whaling area and the grave on the right is of a whaler who died there. Yeah, even the snow and the, the ground flows from one picture to the other. So we, we are authors, typographers, we are the designers, the photographers, and the publishers of this work, Antarctica. And uh, I guess something too that's really surprising to people about the Antarctic is the color, the color of Antarctica. As we said earlier, much of it is shrouded in darkness, but when the spring sunshine comes and it lights up, it is one of the most spectacularly colorful places on the planet. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, 346 some pictures in this book. We encourage you to have a look at that in the library. We close a book through the ice. You have to leave Antarctica through the ice and then the, the, felt, the velvet and then you close to the leather. And uh, we just wanted to introduce a very dear friend of ours who had a 40 year career in the polar world. It's a friend, a mentor, and one of our proofreaders, Charles Swithenbank. And this is what he had to say about our work. A stunning and eclectic portfolio, having myself been to most of the places that the Keels visited, many of their photographs brought back a pang of nostalgia. But as I lacked the eye of the artist, I had looked but seldom appreciated the stark beauty of what I was seeing. And Charles brought to our attention that we had inadvertently in our book recorded the facets, almost every facet of every type of sea ice in that that you could imagine. You know, the breakup and the formation of sea ice, there's all different stages. Being a glaciologist, when he was proofing our book, he said, did you realize you've included every stage? Huh? Said, no, actually, that just happened. All right, so we would be pleased to entertain any questions you might happen to have on this first section on the introduction. So just a reminder to everyone, please add your questions uh, using the Q&A uh, feature on the bottom of your screen. And uh, 
while we're waiting for questions to come in, I have a question uh, for you. Um, you mentioned how many uh, photos are in the volume. I'm just curious, how many photographs did you take that didn't make it into the book? And were there any criteria that you used to help you select the photos? That, that that's that's a have? really good question, because uh, these pictures were taken in the days of film. And I, we'll be going into this a little later on. but. It was shot on film, so we had to be parsimonious. Also, we didn't know necessarily that the pictures we were taking were actually turning out. As it turned out, we had some misfires. One time, one of our camera lenses froze up, and we didn't know it till we got home months later that everything shot on that lens had failed. Mm -hmm. So over the two years, we actually shot 400 rolls of 35 millimeter film, which is 36 exposures on each and that works out to 7,000 pictures each but today on you know burst mode on your digital camera you can take 7,000 pictures in 15 minutes mm -hmm. and we as Pat said we did a limited supply of film and if you ran out that was it mm -hmm. so you had to be very careful about what you were shooting we had a friend who came back from Africa a few years ago and he shot 27,000 pictures in Africa and we said, how are you going to edit all those? <laughs> it was impossible. <laughs> but that's the digital age. People shoot like they're firing a gun, machine gun yeah, or something. So we still are very selective now because we came through the training from film. Sure, sure. Very good question. So, and then the criterion, we wanted to have a balance between the interior of the continent as well as the coast. The Australian side, the African side, the, the South American side. We didn't get to all parts of Antarctica. That was just not possible. There were no expeditions going to all parts of the Antarctic. But we wanted to strike a balance because it's not a book solely about penguins or icebergs. We have we have sea, we have snow algae in there. We've got different things that you wouldn't realize is in the Antarctic. Well, thank you so much. We've had a couple of questions come in here. Um, so the first question is, uh, what was the biggest challenge shooting with film in that climate? The biggest challenge? Well, oh. one thing was, and, and it would be, I guess, the same with, with any camera, when you're in a blizzard situation, your camera is getting encrusted. Oh, yeah, this has strictly to do with film. So you're in a blizzard situation and the camera's getting covered with snow. And now you've had 36 pictures and you're out of film. And you have to change roles. You have to roles. change roles. Like, and what are you gonna do? Because you can't open the back of the camera and let snow blow into it as you, as you change the role. So you have to go into a tent, have a, 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 like a shoe brush and brush all the snow off and then a camel hair brush and get rid of the rest of the snow. Now slowly rewind because the film can get static electricity and crack even. And the static electricity puts blue lines across it. So you're, and that was all for 36 shots. And, and uh, a warm day on the interior, like a warm day is minus 25. And so it's really, really difficult at times to operate equipment at that. Yeah, okay, good question. Hey, thank you. Um, our next question. Thank you very much for this beautiful work and also for the amazing presentation. My question is if you have noticed differences from the first time you went there to the late, uh, latest trip that you took there. Many thanks. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And that's one of the sections we would like to present to you if we get through our <laughs> first four sections. We have a whole section on climate change because yeah. there are major differences. That's a very good yeah. question. And that is a topic that can be a full lecture on its own. Hopefully we'll have time to get to it. Um, our next question, um, I've had to work with very large books and they can kind of self-destruct under their own weight, especially if mishandled or put on display. Was any consideration given to warranties or damage protection when putting the book together? Well, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Our book, you can pick it up by the covers and I can shake it like a rag and it will not fall apart. And I've actually done that on a television show and I inadvertently dropped the book on my toe and almost broke my foot. <laughs> but it's that well built. 
yeah. that it will not fall apart. Our section three will go into the binding and uh, the weight of this book, the size of it is all considerations. We had purchased a copy of Helmut Newton's book, Sumo, uh, which came out in 2000 and it fell apart on our floor in the living room. And we thought, no, that, you cannot have a big book that falls apart. So that gave us the incentive to go right back to hand binding methods. And uh, our book is special in that it combines split board construction with the classic European style of leather binding. And it might be the first book to successfully have done that. And that will address the question. And we'll show you actually pictures of that when we get yeah. there. Yeah. We have two more questions. Um, how did you study the camera on the boat? Bean bags. Bean bags. We, we end up with these little bags that Rosemary sewed together, okay. one foot square and about six inches square, full of corn, believe it or not. Granular corn. Like popcorn kernels, which are like Lego, they kind of lock together. It's better than beans and roll around. And that takes out the vibration of the ship's engines, which transfers itself through the metal hull and up through the stanchions. Yeah. Okay, and our last question, uh, when did you make the switch to digital cameras? Are you as happy with the picture quality? We hung in with uh, film for many years because we couldn't get what we wanted out of the digital cameras, but I guess it would have been like 2012, 2012, somewhere there, but say 10, 12 years ago, we switched when we knew that the digital had finally pulled level yeah. with film like Kodachrome 25. When we knew we were at that point, we switched to digital. Yeah. And what's, for, to put this in perspective, to get the scans done for our Antarctica tome, that was about maybe $50,000 of scanning, but that just gives you scans that don't have color saturation and contrast right. And then you have to spend all this time in Photoshop with that digital file to achieve what was in the original slide. So when you start with a digital image, you're that much further ahead. However, our, um, our slides are archival. <laughs> And yeah. they'll be there, whereas the digital depends upon do you have a reader to read those that data. Maybe we should go on yeah. now if we could. Perfect. Thank All you. All right. So you're mo and thank you for the questions. Section two is a little bit about what it was like to be in the Antarctic and our experiences as parents there. So we traveled by boat, by aircraft, aircraft. like this, the big illusion. Uh, lived in tents. Um, <laughs> We brought our seven-year-old son with us who became quite adept at climbing up glaciers and doing all sorts of weird things that no other child would do. And uh, we had a wonderful time together and we look back very fondly at those years in Antarctica. We traveled with, with adventurers, were they mountain climbers, kayakers, sometimes we were with scientists. Here's Gary Miller and he's studying uh, more penguin mortality and our son's job in those <laughs> days, I guess, because it was a scientific expedition, he would be responsible to find the newly deceased. So we'd see our son coming, walking out of a penguin colony with dead penguins under each arm, carrying two dead penguins. And uh, we, we would say, well, Glenn, how did you know they were dead? And he would just roll his eyes a little bit as you do you not know anything. Of course, he, the, the live uh, live penguin will use dead ones as a pillow. That's how you know who's dead. The ones who are pillows. <laughs> we were on icebreakers, ice breakers. and uh, we were out. Pat and I were out on the upper deck taking photographs. And as we came into the bridge, the first mate was indicating, "Come, come, come." He doesn't speak English. He's Russian. Yeah. And he's pointing out back, and we just came from being out back, and we're looking at the straight line where the ice has been pushed away. And we're looking, are there whales there? Is there a Ross sea, seal? What's yeah. special? Well, what he points out after is that it was our son, Glenn, who was at the helm of this yeah. icebreaker for the last half hour. Yeah, so the crew took a great liking to Glenn and he would uh, go up and whether it was in a helicopter or conning the ship, they would let him do it, but keeping an eye on him, of course. Yeah, so it's quite, now, of interest, he now is an accountant. <laughs> he didn't go into the exploration or sciences world. 
Uh, and we mentioned whales. These are a killer whale. There are two, and there are three others that have just submerged, and you'll see they're rushing up to this yep. pan of ice where there's some penguins that are backing up in terror. They're type C killer whales, and they would come up, they would charge up onto that block of ice and hopefully using their body weight, tilt the ice a bit enough that the penguins would slide into the water and they could grab one or two. And how big is an icebreaker? Well, we've done what's called a garage, which is where you ram the icebreaker into some very thick, fast ice so that people can get walk off the ship literally on the gangplank and go out. There's Glenn, and that shows you how big this icebreaker is. And once ashore, we could go and hike up uh, glaciers. This is looking uh, towards Mount Herschel in the distance in Victoria land. And uh, you'd end up with beautiful, beautiful scenes like this from a crevasse in the glacier. Or we'd hike and actually walk through some of the crevasses, spectacular things that had an unearthly blue color to them. Mm -hmm. We had the opportunity to travel with helicopters, and this is how you get inland. We're now, just from perspective, we're south of Australia, New Zealand. We're deep into the Ross Sea, and we're heading into Victoria Land, into the dry valleys. And why are they called dry? It's because the glaciers, as they move forwards, they are sublimating or going directly from solid to get gas. So they don't melt into water. They just literally evaporate. They just go into gas. And, and they never reach the sea. In fact, this glacier called the Canada Glacier is 60 kilometers inland from, from the sea. And also here, there's some very strange things. This seal, this ancient, ancient seal 2000. is over 2,000 years old. They've carbon dated it. And it's amazing. It's been, it wandered inland over 60 kilometers inland and died there, of course, from malnutrition. And it's been lying there for 2,000 years. And there has been no snow, as you can see. This is the way it looks all year there. It's yeah. a very dry desert. Yeah, the, the dry valleys have had no permanent snow cover in at least 2 million years. And it was here that scientists first found in those rocks. You see all those rocks in this picture? Well, between the grains that make up the crystals, bacteria lives. And that gave people the thought, ah, maybe on Mars we should look in the rocks for life. It's called endolithic life. So life within rocks. NASA has spent a lot of time in this area studying that very thing to see if they can apply finding the same life on Mars and yeah. other planets. And since we had helicopters, we could do some aerial photography. We're flying. This is one of the pictures within the book. This is an iceberg. The large icebergs are given names. This is B-19 where this is February 2000. It's called a tabular iceberg. If you think of tabletop tabular, if you look at that picture, the face, the broken face is roughly 100 feet or 30 meters high, but nine tenths of that ice is out of sight under the water. You can imagine the expense of our expeditions to get these images entirely self-financed. We had no government or private or corporate support. And uh, while we were helicoptering and then landed on that iceberg and took photographs, our son Glenn was also busy on the same iceberg. He had to keep himself busy. So what he did in this particular case was set about building a little igloo. <laughs> and we, we got a kick out of it. Now, what is funny, B-19 was floating around. It actually went right around the continent of Antarctica, slowly breaking up. But we actually saw some of it on the opposite side of Antarctica 17 years later. And we wondered, by chance, would that piece have Glenn's iceberg still atop it? <laughs> <laughs> we had the opportunity to visit several of the scientific bases. This is McMurdo and the American state station, and next to it is mm -hmm. Scott Base of the New Zealanders. You see a little white church, the Chapel of the Lady of the Snows. Now this is on Ross Island, which is set into the Ross Ice Shelf. The ice shelf is the size of Texas or, this, or the country of France. There's another much older base on this same island, one used by Scott, Robert Falcon Scott in 1911. And in the distance on Windbane Hill, you see a cross. 
But these are, this is a picture of Scott and his men who headed to the South Pole. And of course, Scott there about a month after Amiston already had, and he lost his life. All the men lost their lives returning to this base and never got back. And so when you go into the interior of this cabin, it is a spooky sort of thing. You go, you go in and it's like they just stepped out, okay. even though it's a hundred years later. So we're actually inside the cabin or the hut that was Scott's and it had all filled up with snow because the boards shrunk it's, a, it's everything desiccates it's a desert and finds a snow blew in and in the international geophysical year of 1956 57 uh, people mm -hmm. went in and cleaned out all the ice and brought it back to what you see but well, what's amazing is you can still smell the burnt blubber, you yeah. can smell the man. I'll read this to you a little bit from our text. Except that this hut is here in Antarctica, it is visually rather unremarkable until one opens a door and glimpses within. To step inside is to step back in time. Immediately, we are hit by a strong pungent smell of smoke, burnt seal blubber, grime, and unwashed bodies that permeates all. The odor is not unpleasant. It's rather comforting and speaks of men and life during the heroic era. Coal and blubber fueled their stoves for warmth and cooking, and also for melting the snow and ice, water for drinking and washing being otherwise non-existent. And soot darkens the walls. As our eyes adjust to the dim interior, we recognize a setting so familiar from old photographs by Herbert Ponting. There before us in the center of the hut is a famous wardroom table where Scott and his men shared meals, debates, celebrations, plans, and dreams of attaining the South Pole, an ill-fated expedition that would cost, cost Scott and four companions their lives. Today, the presence of these men remain very real. They have left their personal possessions, scientific equipment, and supplies lying about, and on and on and on. And so if you look at that picture, in the back you'll see the dark doorway. That dark doorway is the entrance to Herbert Ponting's studio, his photographic studio, and he was a remarkable photographer. This picture on the left, the inset picture, is Scott at the far end of the table and his men all having a feast at that particular table you see down in front of Ponting's studio. Yeah, and Ponting was using glass plates. You can imagine, glass plates. And in that studio with the tar paper blocking out all the light, he would, he would um, prepare his plates and he would to then take his images and then he would, would uh, process them. We, when we went there, we were using film. And you may remember some of these boxes and rolls of Velvia and Kodachrome. And we had seven camera bodies with us. Seven camera bodies, because from time to time, the cameras, as we used them, would actually freeze up. Sometimes we only managed to get four or five shots off before the shutter wouldn't work anymore because the equipment was frozen. But more also, too, you could not change your ISO or ASA as you can today, on your, even on your cell phones, as well as on all digital cameras we had to have a separate camera for each different ASA. So we had slow speed film in one camera, a medium speed film in another, and 400 ASA in a third. So we both had three cameras with us at all time and one spare. We had both had our own tripods. We would sometimes hang a heavy bean bag off the tripod so that the wind would, uh, wouldn't move the tripod. And we even carried a children's sled with us so that at times we could Pull our equipment rather than to have to carry it. That's correct. So looking across, this is a picture taken in the interior of Antarctica. And these are the tops of a mountain range. The ice at on average is over two kilometers thick. The thickest point of the Antarctic ice sheet is almost five kilometers thick. Think about that. That's almost a mile thick. And that makes Antarctica the highest continent. And NASA said that uh, should this ice sheet melt, which is 90% of the world's ice, sea levels around the world would rise by 60 meters or 200 feet. 
Now that's not going to happen in our lifetimes, but it just shows you how much ice there is. And believe it or not, on those exposed bits of rock in these high mountains. You'll see that it's not all just snow, but there is actually windblown rock there. You will get a bird called the snow petrel nesting there. It's the most southerly of birds. We'll show you a picture of one later. This is the side of Mount Vincent Massive, which is the tallest mountain peak at 4,892 meters in Antarctica. And we were with a bunch of mountain climbers here out to climb the mountain. And the, the, the aircraft that we travel with from a base, a private base camp, is a Canadian aircraft, the Twin Otter. There's here we have First Air, and the other company is Ken Boric, flies the Antarctic work. What and, they uh, do with the plane is you'll see there's tethers. They put a pin, a, a metal pin, into the ice, and then the, the plane literally skids around as the wind blows. The nose always stays into the wind which is a safe position for it to be in. It's rather like a uh, ship on an anchor that they can blow around with the wind. And also you'll notice the on the wings where the engines are, it looks quite dark. Those are shrouds so that you don't get snow blowing into the engines. It's a big deal to operate in the Antarctic and you don't go by yourself. Mm. You have to go with a whole team. Mm. Usually it's bright and sunny. In summer, it's the brightest and sunniest place on earth. Most of the way often when you're not in the mountains and that this is what it looks like. This is Sastrugi, which is concrete hard blown snow. And believe me, it is hard. It's very, very almost like a rock. And the sastrugi can be inches high or it can be a meter and a half high. And this is why when you're traveling with a ski plane, which is the main way of moving within the in the continent by plane, is you have to very tentatively put one ski down and then the other to Just make sure touch. you don't rip your ski off on sastrugi. And you also have to land when there's good visibility. And we've had situations where our fuel cache was maybe only 10 kilometers in front of us, but we were prevented from going there because of fog. And so we put down with our plane and thought for a few hours, but we ended up in the same place for three or four days. So you end up with the windblown snow, very fine snow that yeah. creates this fog. Now, and most of Antarctica is snow and ice because it's a big continent, but the coast where you have access to the krill in the sea that's where there's life and there's an abundance of life and it's a marvelous wonderful area to visit for those of you who've been fortunate enough you've have seen some of these beautiful this is elephant point and these are of course elephant seals standing there gentoo penguins now notice there's one big male in the center he's looking at us see his eyes open right dead center in yeah. the picture there that gives a little tension between you as a viewer and this animal so it draws you into the picture it's what you hope for when you're taking a picture that you have that eye contact yeah. and at least one and then having on stage right bottom corner the gentoo it gives you a sense of the size perspective here and gentoos this is a gentoo penguin it's the one that's got a white headband from eye to eye in this picture what we really like is the little bit of the red bill the red feet and the red dulse, which is an austral dulse. It's the most common of the seaweeds. I also like that white headband and the white chunks of ice mixed in with the seaweed. Another very common uh, penguin in this area is a chin strap penguin. Chin strap, you can see why it's named chin strap because it looks like it's wearing a chin strap. And you'll see the penguin on the right, it's got a freshly laid egg. But the one up at the upper part on the left, it's got a little chick if you look closely. Yeah. And as to the question about what's happening, chin straps are in great decline right now. And the the uh, gentoos are exploding in numbers. So there's winners and losers with climate change. The Antarctic also has, up near the coast, wonderful moss beds. And these moss can be hundreds, maybe even thousands of years old growing just a millimeter each year because their growing season when there's moisture that is liquid moisture as opposed to frozen is very short. Another thing that you encounter along the coast is snow algae. You will look up at the side of a mountain or a hillock and it's all covered in, it looks pink to the eye and it's covered in pink or in some cases green snow algae like you're seeing here. Yeah. And it can be spectacularly beautiful. 
And the family of organisms that has the most diversity and the most numbers are lichen. And lichen, there's lichen within about 400 miles of the South Pole, even on Mount Roland. And here you've got the oranges. There's all different kinds of lichen. And also on a diagonal towards the bottom third of the picture, you'll see something that's not lichen. That actually is a hair grass. It's one of only two vascular plants plant set to, can transport water and nutrient through its cells. That's only two that are native to the Antarctic. And these are being neutrified by that Cape Petro, by, its, by the guano from that bird that's nesting on the ledge. The side of mountains can be just a vibrant color, a sea of color yeah. with the lichens and that. Very, very beautiful. Mention the snow petrel that breeds further south than any other bird. This bird has also been seen at the South Pole. Petrels have that name, petrel as in St. Peter, which walked on the water. So these birds, they walk on the water as they go in. They're another, another krill eater. You'll see as you travel around the peripheral part of Antarctica, whales and that, you, you end up with many, many whales and the whales are coming back. A lot of humpbacks and that now showing up in Antarctica. Yeah, yeah and fin whale and, and, and there's some blue whale now, and of course, lots of minke whale. These had been practically, the terminology is fished out uh, the turn of the century. In fact, commercial whaling only ended in 1968. There's a whole story about that and would be another lecture to share. But in this picture too, it exemplifies the beautiful light of Antarctica. And it will linger on the light. You'll end up with a, a, a scene like this for hours and hours, the pinks will just hang in because you've got that long, long period after the sun goes down until it comes back up higher in the sky. It will be sunset and sunrise for hours. Yeah, no, photographers often talk about the golden hour, the blue hour, which in some latitudes might only be like if you're in the tropics, sundown is within minutes. But here you have these long lingering sunrises and sunsets. We'll take a few questions about this section. We don't have any questions just yet. So if, if you do have any questions, again, feel uh, free to add them to um, the Q&A. Well, while people are thinking about questions, as we may not get to the section on climate change, Something that's happening is that with the warmer temperatures, particularly on the peninsula, which is the area south of South America, the air can hold more moisture, which means more precipitation. And penguins need to breed on rock, all except for the emperor, which breeds on the ice. So the penguins need to be on rock so they can get pebbles to make a nest out of pebbles. So their nests are little groupings of pebbles that they put together that keep their eggs up off the ground underneath more or less. And why is because there will be snow melt at some point and you don't want an egg to be submerged in water because it will suffocate. The eggshell is porous. And, and so we're seeing more snow cover, which means a delayed breeding season. In fact, this year, the breeding season was delayed a whole month. And that means a lot of chicks will not Sure. not uh, grow and fledge in time for the onset of the next winter. So things are changing. We've had a comment and a question come in. So the comment is, this has been a phenom phenomenal travelogue. I agree, wonderful. Um, and the question here, um, I feel like you've touched on this earlier, um, but if you'd like to expand on it, that would be wonderful. Um, have you had an opportunity to use digital camera equipment in this environment, and has it presented any different challenges in use? Yes, yes, we've been back to the Antarctic as field guides for the tourism industry, and we were responsible for creating slideshows for all the guests. So yes, we were taking digital images and then by the end of the end of the journey, we'd already put a slideshow together that everyone could take home. I think we can only do that with digital. Yeah, couldn't do it any other ways. We we have been to Antarctica about thirty five or forty times, all over the place, and so we know the continent quite well, and we are aware of the challenges involved with photography, and we have learned to 
deal with it. Deal with it, yeah. Yeah, and I would say digital is, at this stage is absolutely excellent so long as you have got enough battery power. Like you've got to have the ability to recharge those batteries. The old film cameras had a little button battery that lasted five years. Now with digital, we'll go through a battery a day easily. And we also always bring our computers and the ability to download. So as long as you can, can recharge, it's absolutely excellent. Go for it because you see what you're getting and you can take lots of pictures and catch the krill passing from the mother. Uh, our mother or parent, parent can be a father as well, regurgitating food. To, I'm sorry, giving regurgitated food directly into the mouth of the chick. You can, don't, you can take it up teen pictures and choose the absolute best versus we had to make sure we caught the moment. With but, but discipline yourself. <laughs> Try to be a little parsimonious because like the man who shot 27,000 pictures. You'll never look at them. You can't ever get to see them all. So <laughs> try to be parsimonious. So this is a big uh, area here. We want to spend a lot of time on the book arts. And so we'll, we'll take other questions later on again, but let's move on. There's so much to tell you about book binding and about the leather, about the lithography and why our decisions. So we had done, as we showed you, several commercial books. We knew because we published our own work and later worked as packagers for Stoddart Publishing, we know everything about commercial printing at, in that era and also about how automated binding was done. But the book we had in mind is monumental. As the question came up earlier, how do you support a big book that it doesn't fall apart, that the stitching doesn't get loose, that, that uh, it doesn't self-destruct? So we started our odyssey at special collections libraries. So we visited various special collections libraries here and there around the world. And we started to teach ourselves about how were ancient books that still exist built. How did they build a book yeah. that would last hundreds and hundreds of years? And what actually looks beautiful? What do the connoisseurs of fine books consider to be beautiful? Because we did learn about books that held together. These were your your landscape books, landscape style books that were used as accounting ledgers, even in hundreds of years ago, workbooks. But they look chunky, they look business-like, they're ugly from the connoisseurs. This that we're showing you here, the Aldine Press from the late 1400s for 100 years within the family, these books are absolutely beautiful. Their symbol was the anchor with the dolphin wrapped around it, this full leather binding with raised bands and and something I want to point out to you, and I hope it shows off. You'll notice the book on the left is has what's called a French groove, that vertical indent. Right along the spine. It looks like a dark line going down. It's actually a V-shaped groove called a French groove. And it's because the cover board has been pulled away from the spine so that you only have, in that case, cloth as your hinge. And that way it's easy to open a book flat. But these books from the Renaissance era and finely hand-bound books done by specialty binders today don't have the benefit of that French group and yet the books still open. Why? So we want to learn about that. And we also then looked at these beautiful marbled papers and we became aware that some of them are pasted down as an overlay. So you've got your leather coming into the inside cover and the rough edge covered over top by this pasted down so overlay. So the, the edge of the paper is laying on top of the folded over leather. Yeah. So there's another. And there's another way of doing this. And this caught our attention. It's called a doublure, which in French simply means lining. And in this case, you have an inlay. So the other, the book on the left has overlay. It's over the top of the leather. Here on the right, there has been a window cut. So the leather is brought over, as you can see there, and they cut a window in the leather, and then they place the finished material right into that window, matching perfectly. And that window could be 
something. It could be some, a piece of art drawn, a drawing. It could be silk. It could be um, marble paper. In our case, it's the velvet. So our this is our bindery. Keith Felton, his hands, and he's holding a bone folder. You're looking in the foreground. It's the inside cover, and where his hands are, that is the doublure, and he's matching where the leather joint meets the velvet in the window of the doublure. This is not an overlay, it's an inlay. And they have to meet exact. If there's a sliver of difference, you're gonna see it. And it's actually perfectly level. So the velvet is totally level with the, the um, leather that folds over the side. Yeah. It's very, very beautifully, perfectly done. Like you've got different materials but you have to have the heights right and no gaps. So with our book, we've shown you this velvet earlier. You've got the doubler inlay on the left. On the right, we have a fly leaf, but we threw our prototypes because we did several years of prototyping and we found if the fly leaf was too thin, too thin, it rolled as you turned the book and the velvet, the friction of the velvet got caught on the doubler. And with the weight of other pages coming, the flyleaf bent. It could cause it to back buckle. So what we had to do is make the flyleaf stiff enough that it wouldn't buckle as it was turned over. And this necessitated our creating, as you can see in the middle, a beautiful leather joint. Because the leather joint now gives a flexibility to be able to turn the stiff flyleaf. So, you know, we come up with a brilliant design idea, an artistic idea of this velvet and the, the modeling in it, but then it makes a challenge from a structure. <laughs> we get it, as we mentioned, we pass through our ice and we come into the book. It's a triptych. And we also, as we're looking at these beautiful ancient books, we're starting to learn about leather. And we found out that um, there's only a few companies in the world that still tan leather specific to, for books. Today, there's only three companies left in the world that, that know how this. to do this. And our books are clad in what's called genuine Morocco leather. And is it from Morocco? No, it's leather that has been garnered from places that grow goats <laughs> that have enough hide on them to clad. We needed yeah. two goat hides to clad each one of our books. Our books, when they're open, are 36 inches wide, and then you've got the turnovers, so we needed a large piece. Anyway, we'll get into that in a moment. <laughs> what I wanted to point out is um, we have our logo, our iceberg logo. You see the beautiful textured grain. This is a fine grain goat leather. Then you'll see the X at the top. There's chromium. This is not chromium tannage. Chromium tannage is for Purposes like your shoes, your upholstery, uh, gloves, clothing. It can be done in, in a matter of hours. Ours, you'll see the check mark beside the skin with a leaf. Ours is vegetable tanned with black oak, sumac, and also tannins from a nut called tara that's collected in the high Andes. And its nut was actually used by the Incas at, uh, for their leather so many, many years back and it's taken down to the coast with donkeys and that and eventually shipped to the tannery in scotland you wouldn't believe what it okay. goes through and hewitt's themselves they've been in business in the same family since the, since the 1700s that's the time captain cook was discovering the hmm. west coast where pat and i live I mean, it's a crazy story uh, very few people make this leather anymore we use skins, actual skins of the goats. And Roger Barley here is inspecting each one for flaws because it's a natural product. And if an animal has been injured, say it rubbed against an acacia tree and it got a, a scratch, a now there's going to be a scar. Well, did we want to have the distressed look in our in our book? It could We could have chose that. No, we chose fine, perfect skins. But Roger would spend a couple of hours each day under a north light, not a direct light, a north light, inspecting each of the hides before they were used on our books. For the first half of the binding, 
it took a two year lead time to accumulate the skins that were of the quality forest. There's a whole story about tannage and you mm -hmm. can learn a lot of that on Hewitt's website. We're just gonna show you a little something here. Um, the green was our custom dye for our book, Labyrinth Sublime, which is on the West Coast, which is the rainforest. These hides, once they have been tanned, colored, now they go through this machine where this lady is feeding them one at a time. It's called a skiving machine. And what it's doing is making the skins an even thickness. They're suede on the underside of the leather. And you want an even thickness in your leather. So it's sort of when you pick up a handful of this shavings, it looks like sawdust almost. And believe it or not, what they do with this is they will put it together and mix it with a glue and they will form leather sheets using this leather glued together and they call it genuine leather. Right, and we're trying to make this distinction because people ask, why do our books cost so much? This is one of the points. So just as with pulp makes paper, shavings of leather make leather sheets. And to give it a texture, there are these plates, these metal embossing plates, which can create a full pattern. You could have a goat full pattern, a cow, or exotics like crocodile, crocodile. <laughs> snake, emu. And when you buy a purse or a wallet, shoes, and a menu, and it says genuine leather, they're not kidding you. It is genuine leather. Gen it if it says genuine leather, in our opinion, it's not it's, it's, it's what we've just talked about, the shavings. It's, it's man-made genuine leather. Our books use Morocco, which is a genuine natural, natural. leather. And that word natural is very important. <laughs> yes. So if, if they're selling you something that doesn't have the word natural in it, then it is not natural leather. Leather. So there's a, that's one another point of price. <laughs> and Morocco doesn't... Ref well, it sort of refers to sort the name of, yeah. of the country, Morocco. But the, the, if you think about the great knowledge, it was the Arabic people who had knowledge way, way, way back then, when before and when the rest of Europe was in the Dark Ages. And they had beautiful hand-bound books clad in leather. That leather and the way they tanned it is what we know today as Morocco. And that leather is quite archival. In fact, the tannery in Scotland has even put a buffer into their leather so that it can withstand any air pollution um, acidity over centuries. I believe that is the case. So now that we had, uh, we thought, okay, we know more about leather. We know a lot about binding that binders it, that we have met shared with us. They're very generous, but these same binders we met said, gosh, if we did your project, it would be 20 years of my life, and I don't want to dedicate 20 years of my life to one project. You've got to find someone else to do this. Somebody capable of binding a run of 950 50. books. So we asked the leather companies. We said, who buys your leather? And who amongst them do you think could handle a project of this size? And they gave us a short list, one of which was Felton Book Binding, right near you in Ontario, there in Georgetown. Couldn't find nicer people, yeah. wonderful guys. Keith Felton on the right-hand side there is a master binder, but a hell of a fine man. And so are his other two master binders, Willie on the far left. He apprenticed in Switzerland. He's worked in many parts of the world, fine binder. And Chris, Chris came <laughs> all the way from Scotland to work on our project for several years. He's back in the UK now, but these three fellows dedicated many years to our project but they were one of two companies that we worked with for another full year harcourt in boston was the other harcourt is a bindery that has been in existence for over 100 years and together we worked on these prototyping of ancient traditional skills because we wanted to combine elegance and strength and durability which we were told was traditionally and technologically impossible we were told you couldn't combine that two. You couldn't have elegance and strength at the same time. But we you could have strength or elegance, but not both together. But we were determined and we were outsiders. And we found that we could really work with Keith to <laughs> find a way. And we will continue that story because meantime, we're multitasking. We're also checking into the lithography. <laughs> so we were looking around. We were trying to determine who 
would print the book. And we eventually ended up with a short list of printers in Canada, the United States, and other places. And we sent them four identical images that we had determined we would send to each one of them the same image. And then we would compare it. They would put it up on the, the printing press. They would put it on the same paper as we wanted to use. We would then compare each of the images and make a choice as to who was the best. We weren't saying we were going to be in Canada or the United States or wherever in Europe or Japan. We just wanted the best. And it was important that they did the test on the production press, not on a hand press or a, 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 a proofing system. We wanted to see the production press. And to put this in perspective at that time, make ready the time of getting the temperatures of the ink up to, to a certain viscosity, getting the colors to flow correctly. Matt, you probably used about two hours of paper going through the presses. So it was a huge expense for each of the companies who were under consideration. But when we got the sheets and looked at them, there's one that was so outstanding. We wondered, just, what is this? We've never seen this before. Blew us away. We couldn't believe the clarity, the beauty, the sharpness of the images. We. We just, we said it has to be this one. What would you believe? It was hemlock printing right here in Vancouver, right in our backyard. And that was totally by chance that they were the ones. But then we had to find out, well, what in heaven's name were they doing? Yeah, and they had just recently been asked by a company, a Burnaby BC company called Creo, Creo SciTech, which is the Israeli portion of it, to test, to beta test a brand new screening technology called 10 micron stochastic printing. And it is remarkable. We just this picture here comes from Hemlock just to show. So this is not our photography, but look at the eyelashes of this lady with her mascara. And now the conventional screening, you have a dot matrix florets you see all those little dots in the circle up on the left they're all dots well that's normal that's what you often see yeah now look at the stochastic at the bottom how fine those dots are and at the edge resolution so this ultra high resolution printing method gave sharper edge definition greater detail smoother color gradients which you can see the color gradient even in there you can put more ink on without having something called dot gain and what was important for us is that the color gamut was expanded multifold because the color snow and ice can very quickly not look real. And by having this, this delicacy of color gamut and gradients, we thought, wow, this is just phenomenal. We're going for it. And they didn't tell us it was just being beta tested. <laughs> we didn't know that at the time. But anyhow, what ended up happening is we chose Hemlock with their 10 micron stochastic, and we are the first book in the world to be printed using 10 yeah. micron stochastic printing. Which is why we've won so many international awards for the printing. So now we had our printer, we had our binder, and now we went back to the Antarctic. Hallelujah, we're back in nature and that's what we love. And the, the orange box, that shows you the part of the Antarctic that we were able to access. We, uh, we went with, with whomever we could pay our way to get to different parts of the Antarctic. So come home and get the film processed and uh, go through the slides and start choosing and putting on the light tables and editing. And it was agony, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, we, we could do 15 different books, but uh, it's it was a big choice getting into all of these yeah. images and then choosing the images yeah. that we would use. And I'm just going to move a little quickly because there's so much we want to tell you. But we, we So we wrote the book, we designed them in Quark Express, we did the typography ourselves, and then we we had, at that stage, we didn't have the Photoshop skills to work on the sc scanned uh, images. So we had an expert to work with us for quite some time, lots of proofing. Finally, we have the, the uh, files ready to go and we have delivery of our custom made paper. Paper has a grain, it folds easier in one direction than another. And our size of book and the format of it was not your standard. So of you, course- You wanted the pages to bend, bend nicely because they're long pages, they had to fold over well. So we had to have special 
paper runs done just for yeah. our book. The paper grain has to run parallel to the spine. And we have two papers, uh, one that uh, was a felt finish, genuine cotton, and that was for the text section, and then one with titanium enamel coating for the colored section, because that set the inks up high. Oh, our inks, German light fast inks and direct to plate etching by lasers onto the printing plates. And we were at printing for several months, checking each page for everything from, from little then, blemishes to Believe color. it or not, one time a pressman cut his finger and, mm -hmm. and we ended up with about eight books, not finished books, but eight sets of pictures and pages with blood on them. Oh, we didn't want someone else's DNA in our book. These pictures are actually from Labyrinth Sublime where we took more, more images during the process. But when we sign off for the color that it's right, it's now the pressman's job to make sure they maintain it. But we pull every 50th sheet and we check it throughout the process. That was several months, but then starts six months of really tough work for the two of us. We don our finger cots, and we check every single page in every one of our books looking for flaws. Our book is so heavy, it cannot be automatedly collated. It had to be collated by hand. And this is now where we're checking every page of every book. Standing there for hours and hours every yeah, day. Six months. Because every page had to be its own limited edition art piece. And there's our books ready to go to the bindery. Yeah. Huh, but what happens, what happens to what we threw out, it all got shredded and it becomes new paper and roofing tiles. And this is more than just our rejects, that's, that's standard. But it's in the brand. But we of... want to take you back to Keith and also introduce you to Joan and Jackie. These two women sold every page in our books. Yeah, hand by hand using Irish linen thread, needle and thread. Irish linen thread will not stretch or rip over the years. It yeah. holds together very hold well. for centuries. It will not stretch, unlike synthetic threads. And you cannot use linen threads on machines throwing them. And there's a whole story as to why. For the next book, Keith realized it would be more efficient if he made he invented a guillotine that pre-punched the holes using the same dimension of needles as we did later for the hand sewing. Back to our study of ancient books, what makes the European classic? Well, amongst the many features are the full leather cover, rounded spine, raised, raised head and tail, tail bands. bands. Yeah, and, and, um, and how do you get the rounded? Well, you have to hammer the round shape. And note the tapes here from the linen, from the sewing. Those are integral to the strength of the book and you see the gray that's upside down there that's the leather joint that's upside and that is glued on to the fly leaf and so how do you do that well you have to remove some of the suede so that you don't get bumps and that's all done by hand it's called skiving and the shoulders of the book that fit into the cover boards have to be rounded and flared out and that's what he's doing right here hammering it out yeah, eventually the cover boards sit into that L-shaped indent on the edge of each of the sides of the book block. And again, pay attention to those tapes. And the, all the embossing of the leather is all done using specially heated tools on that little furnace in the background. <laughs> and it's all done by hand, all of the embossing, everything. Yeah. Chris here, he does, he's using our brass dies and he stamps our, say like our, our iceberg logo and then he takes a look because each hide takes a stamp different we had lots of prototyping on different temperatures you can see him holding a snipe on the end of the lever that he pulls down on he actually at times would lift himself off the floor with the pressure he was exerting on them and why the different temperatures is because they'll take a different shine in the embossed area with different temperature into the leather, but you don't want to burn the leather. Flip the cases over. The, now we've got our covers all decorated. On the inside, we have our binders board. This is archival binders board, two plies, a quarter inch in thickness, and look, it's split. This is a secret to how our book is so strong. So we take the tapes that have now been sewn to the bulk of the book, and those tapes are inserted into the split board of the cover 
and then they are glued down together. The splits are glued together and tremendous weight is put on them and they're left for days while they set. Yeah, they're in the press. And so now the page is a book block, which is woven to these linen tapes. The linen tapes are now laminated permanently to the cover. That's why our book doesn't fall apart and you can shake it. Uh, we've got the leather joint there upside down. It covers all of that bulk. It's a huge amount of bulk. And this is how books were done in what's called the split board construction or, or library construction of the time. But it was considered chunky. And when you run your fingers along that edge, you can actually feel the bumps where those leather tape, where the linen tapes are. What was new with our book is we have a book that has a cover that does not have the French groove. So there's no French groove there. You've got the rounded spine and you've got the raised head and tail bands. Yeah, and this wasn't done before. With split board, you always have a French groove because there's too much bulk to be able to open the book, but we, ours does. We didn't think we were gonna be able to do it. And we came up, Rosemary and I being neophytes at this, came up with an idea that we, gave to Keith and we said, would this work? And he actually said, give me a couple of days. And he phoned us up and said, I've sent one to you. It was the first book to our knowledge in the world that has been used combining these two types of binding yeah. in one book. Split board and classic European. And this is Keith with Labyrinth mm -hmm. Sublime, like a couple, I'd say that's about 18 months of effort is under his arms there. But that's only part of the story. There's a, this yeah. wonderful archival, sturdy, protective linen box. It's a clamshell box. Again, lots of work to make this happen. And our design where her hands are, that's an H. So you can put your fingers under the book and lift it without damaging the book. And we've been going quickly because we want to tell you so much and we're running short on time. Yeah. So section three questions, Amanda, over to you. Sure. So our first question is, how, do, how long does a typical exhibition last and is the length dictated by team size or other specific challenges? Well, it depends on where you're going and how you're going, whether you're going in by airplane, whether you're going in, in an icebreaker. Uh, it depends how many people are involved in the, in the expedition you're on. Um, so there's a lot of variables. It depends on weather. Would you believe Rosemary waited one time for about a month in South America, down in Punta Arenas, Chile, waiting to fly to the heart of Antarctica, but it was white out. They couldn't get in there for the longest time. So she was waiting there for there's a month. There's only so much fuel in your plane and you have to, you have to, there's a point part way to the Antarctic where then you've got to keep going to the Antarctic and you've got to know you can land because you don't have enough fuel to turn around and go back to Chile. So uh, you wait till it seems like it's really safe to go. So it's a hard question to answer because Variable. each uh, expedition and depending on where and how you're going is, is what enters into the equation. Yeah. So some can be a month, six, six weeks. Some could be uh, with a tourist group, it might only be 10 days. Great. If you were allergic to nuts, would you have a reaction from the tanned leather? Allergic to what? To nuts. Nuts? I can't answer that. I don't know. I would guess not, but I have no experience on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a good question. Yeah, good question. Uh, your knowledge is great. Have you thought of the legacy of your notes, research, film, etc.? Where will it all go? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. It's even like our slides, you know, what to do with them. The Yale has an archive of everything to do with the book arts, but we have our, our, our slides, the original images, what to do with those. We would like to get them somewhere. But Yale University does have all of our uh, searching, all of the work we've done to create these books. They've even included a book Rosemary did as a very young girl. Yeah. So like the different examples of using um, Irish linen thread, whether it's four thin ply with, so it will say, I'm just using a figure, say uh, 15 twists per centimeter versus two ply with four twists per centimeter, those different prototypes they have there. So with the book arts, we are covered. With our knowledge of Antarctica, 
and our imagery, we're not as of yet, but that's a work in progress. We have to find a way to share this. Great. And a comment has just come through saying, thank you for sharing this amazing journey with us, Rosemary and Pat. Thank you. You're all very, very welcome. Okay. All right, well, just, uh, we have 10 minutes, so we'll just do a little bit in section four yeah. here. So the work has been received by the polar community. This was an event in Davos, Switzerland at the Congress Center. Everyone you see here represents 56, they have representatives from 56 countries that have Antarctic research stations and, and institutes in their countries. And our book was the official book and presented to each country. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that came because the year, two years earlier at one of these meetings, the hosts had presented our work to Sultan Mizan, who is the founder and supporter of Malaysia's um, Antarctic yeah, program. Yeah. And this all led then to the organizers of the Antarctic Treaty meetings of 2019 asking us, would we consider a, having a, a way to work with them that our book could be presented to the head of state of each country that has signed this important treaty? And the reason was is that it was the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. And so from a, science, from a political and a, and a scientific point of view, our work has been really well received. Yeah. And uh, Professor Stephen Chown of Australia, he at the time was the president of the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. He uh, had said some very nice things, including that our work is a compelling and magnificent time, time capsule, capsule of, the, of Antarctic. the Antarctic. And it, in a way it is a time capsule at this point in time. You know, in three or four hundred years, if a lot of it's melted and that, well, it'll look different. It'll look a lot yeah. different. Our, after our launch with Prince Charles and Queen Noor having signed all the copies, various other royals have acquired our work or were presented in the bottom. Students on ice presented a copy to Prince Albert of Monaco, who now has since given our book to a few people himself. Uh, pe but most people who have our books are normal people. <laughs> yeah, private collections all over the world. Yeah, and they might not even have room for such a book yeah. in their home, but they make room. And these are some of the places, including Antarctica, believe it or not, where there are books. And yeah, in private homes yeah. and with institutions. They've overlaid the, uh, the triangles to show institutions where we are with our work. Uh, as been mentioned, Yale yeah. maintains this library this archive of our work is for 30 years and still going on and we're just delighted that our work is there and jay rossman who may be in in uh, in listening on this panel discussion she uh, had said this which is really nice and, and says everything from the librarian's point of view this work is the perfect start to a conversation about a, what a book can be and how a well-designed and constructed book can add to the knowledge inside it Every aspect of Antarctica is well done and worth consideration. From the physical construction, to the layout, to the photography, which gives me many possible ways this book can help with our educational mission. With this one work, I can connect with graduate students from the School of Art, as well as undergraduates in the humanities and the sciences. The beauty of the book draws in the students and the durability allows me to free, feel free to use it again and again without worrying about its fragility. That's, thank you, yeah. Jay. And that's, that's what we strive for, something that is enduring, that is useful, that is beautiful. Many awards have been mentioned in the introduction, we'll skip over that, but many awards for world's best this, that, and the next thing. And then the critics. And the critics yeah. have been generous too. Yeah, we've received accolades from all over. So will there be some yeah. more questions? Well, here? it's kind of, we're just going to go over this real quick. There's, we'll just stop right here because we are within five minutes of yeah. our time. I'm so, sorry to... Sorry about that, but so be it. We have too much enthusiasm that we want to share things with you. And we will stop in just one second. There we go, <laughs> Amanda. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rosemary and Pat, for this really wonderful lecture. Um, I've learned so much, and I, I'm sure all of our um, guests have as well. Um, if there are any final questions, please feel free to, to add them um, using the Q&A button. Um, and while we're while we're waiting for, for that, um, you have worn so many hats in this uh, 
the production of, of Antarctica and Labyrinth Sublime. And I'm just wondering, was there a specific aspect of the book production or design that had the steepest learning curve? Good one. I would say it was the binding. The yeah. binding. binding was the biggest learning curve because we had no exposure to this mm -hmm. before. And we have Ralph Stanton, who at the time was the curator of special collections at Simon Fraser, to who he was the first to introduce us and he gave us much of his time and then various specialty binders, designer binders and restorer binders, individuals who gave freely of their time. And this is why on our website, we have a section called Creating a Keo Tome. And under there, we have blogs of each stage of how we produce these books. We have been equally sharing of the information because people were so good to us. But, uh, without all the experts that helped us, we would have been nowhere because we did we knew nothing about finding a book like this at the beginning. <laughs> no. It was all a learning experience the whole way. Yeah. We're receiving a lot of comments. I'm in absolute awe. Encore, please. Thank you so much for an interesting and inspiring presentation. Um, and I think uh, we might end on this last question here. Um, thank you for this great showcase. How long did it, Antarctica take to create from conception to publication? We've been saying, I, I think it was around six years. Find, so we, Finding, we had the idea of it while we were doing our other books. Yeah. And then when we got serious, say, yep, yeah, we're going to go at this. It was the two years in Antarctica and then the binding and in between all of that, we're doing the prototyping. So it's all together. And the bindery was about five years with the three men and say two years of the sewers, because we wanted to do the whole project at once, not, not to do it in, then in bits and pieces. So yeah, about, about yeah. six six years. All, all told, I, brought, uh, I mean, yeah. if you think about all the time we put into it, it was probably close to a decade. But that's just, producing the books. Another whole discussion mm -hmm. is now you've got to sell them. There's a business end of being an artist. The marketing <laughs> end, the publicity end, that's something really different unless you've got a team behind you. Yeah. That's something that you as the artist then have to look after as well. And that's that's an still ongoing. Story too. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rosemary and Pat, so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I did. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.